the thing that DMC taught me is that we're going to have a long career. You know, I remember, you know, driving in the car with him and he was like, L, you know, we're on our fourth album. I'm like, yeah, yeah. He said, so we'll definitely have a ninth album. He made me think about things long term. You know, DMC, plus he was very meticulous. He's like a neat freak. So everybody else's room looked like a, you know, looked like a tornado, a hurricane, and 15 Rottweilers ran through their room with everything you could think of. And DMC's room would be like pristine, like he had a butler and shit. You know, so he taught me how to be meticulous and, you know, keep your shit in order. And, you know what I'm saying? Like, he just is a, he's a very smart guy. There's a reason why Run DMC is who they are. You don't go to certain heights by accident, B. You may get a hit by accident, but you're not going to have a career unless inside of you is as big as the career that you're building. You know what I'm saying? So D is very smart dude. So yeah, yeah, that's my man. So a wild tour story. So um, probably uh, um, one that's funny that I could talk about is um, you know, I was in Scotland. I was on a tour. We was over in Scotland. And, um, you know, this is like, you know, mid 80s or something like that. Right. And, um, you know, at that time over over there, when they like your music, when you really hot, they spit on the stage. But we didn't know that that was complimentary at that time. Like we didn't understand culturally what was going on. So my man got insulted and he jumped off the stage and jumped in the crowd and punched the dude in the face. And then we started fighting. <laughs> Fighting the, the, we was fighting the, the, the arena, and um, my man Bobcat. The funny part is my man Bobcat. He was the, at that time on the road with us. He was the only dude from Cali on the road with us, and he was in the middle of Scott, and he was a crip, you know. And he, he was in the middle of Scott and roll, rolling forty crip, and he's in the middle of Scotland on the stage throwing up gang signs, and he's the only, you know, LA, you know, gang member there, and it was just like. We all look back on it like, cause he was just, you know, he was calling for his people and it was like he was by himself. So that's probably like the wildest shit. Gang signs in Scotland, you know what I'm saying? Um, with no gang. You know, that was pretty wild. You know what I'm saying? And you know, you, we, we was, I'm coming from Queens, Bob coming from, you know, Cali, like, you know, we over there, we run around like, we don't, like, this is ridiculous. Like, you, you know, listen, man. I don't know no brothers that's in, you know, all that spitting. Like, you talk about a problem. Like, you, yo, spitting, that damn near might be worse than, like, putting your hands on somebody. I'm not sure. There's a, that, like, there's a, that could, that's debatable. Like, so it was like, we just didn't understand that shit. And my man Earl, and he was, like, real slow to fight. You know what I'm saying? And Earl, for, for the record, when you look at the Public Enemy logo of the rap group, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame group, Rock, um, Public Enemy, that logo is my man E-Love. Chuck D took a picture, a photo of my hype man, his silhouette, and made that his logo. You know what I'm saying? So when you see the Public Enemy logo, that's E-Love. And E-Love, the guy in that logo, is the one who jumped off the stage and, you know, punched the dude in the face. Then we start fighting. And they're insulted, you know, because <laughs> they don't understand. It was crazy. You know what I mean? You know, so it was, yeah, that shit was nuts. One industry moment that I thought was funny um, it, is that, you know, as I was, you know, maybe 16, 17 years old, and I'm backstage at, uh, you know, Diana Ross, the glam, the, you know, I mean, you know, this is Beyonce before Beyonce. Deon Diana Ross was, you know, back in the days. And, you know, I'm backstage. I'm like 16, 17 years old. She had a special. She was one of the first. She actually was the first person to put me on television. She gave me some help, right? So I'm watching Barry Gordy slap box Muhammad Ali backstage. And I'm like sitting there and Diana's going, oh, Barry. And Barry's like, that was the most, that was the crate. That was a moment when I was like, how did I get here? Because five minutes before that, you know what I'm saying? I was on the, you know, the corner with a 40. You know what I mean? So it was like just seeing things like that. You know what I'm saying? And obviously throughout the years, I know lots of people and seen lots of things. But that was a moment that was bananas for me. Like this Muhammad Ali, like one of the greatest figures ever, slap boxing with the founder of Motown. Backstage, I'm like, yo, I just never thought I would see no shit like that. You know what I mean? That was pretty wild. I mean, I've had so many unbelievable moments with Jay. I mean, I mean, you know, you know, Run DMC took me on tour. You know what I'm saying? And 
put me under their wing in a lot of ways. You know, I was, you know, the reason why I developed this into such a, a, a strong artist, even with the live stuff, is because I had to, you know, basically go against two guys and run DMC every night by myself, which was really a different time then. It was crazy. So, I mean, Jay, I mean, it's just too many stories to name. I mean, I, you know, where do I start? I mean, we weren't like, it wasn't a mentor-mentee relationship. Me and Jay were, we saw ourselves as equals. Um, I did have m more of a mentor-mentee relationship with DMC, uniquely enough. He was the one that would put his arm around me and treat me more like a younger brother. But me and Jay were kind of more like here. Even though he was a little older, just the way we vibed, it was more like, it was, you know, he didn't, it just wasn't like that. But, um, I mean, I just learned so much from them. I mean, I'll tell you one thing that was um, one little interesting tidbit. I mean, people may be familiar, but a long time ago, I made a song called Rock the Bells, a long time ago. And many, many years ago, um, Run DMC made a song. They had this song called Peter Piper. And um, so, you know, everybody can Google Peter Piper and they can Google Rock the Bells if they're not familiar, right? And so the beat for Peter Piper was originally supposed to be for my song, Rock the Bells. But Jay, me and Jay being from the same neighborhood, we have the same influences. He took the Mardi Gras beat and I had already told Rick Rubin what I wanted to do. And Jay ran and did it with Rick with Run DMC. So I had to make all these different versions of Rock the Bells, my song, to try to figure out how to get it right because Jay jumped and, and, and used Mardi Gras. So people can Google it and get the history and the facts. I mean, day one people, of course, know. But for those who are a little younger who don't quite get it, they should Google it and check it out. It's, it's very interesting the way it, way it went. You know what I'm saying? In terms of, he just, the thing that DMC taught me is that we're going to have a long career. You know, I remember, you know, driving in a car with him and he was like, L, you know, we're on our fourth album. I'm like, yeah, yeah. He said, so we'll definitely have a ninth album. He made me think about things long term. You know, DMC, plus he was very meticulous. He's like a neat freak. So everybody else room looked like a, you know, looked like a tornado, a hurricane, and 15 Rottweilers ran through their room with everything you could think of. And DMC's room would be like pristine, like he had a butler and shit. You know what I'm saying? So I go in there and, you know, so he taught me how to be meticulous and, you know, keep your shit in order. And, you know what I'm saying? Like, he just was a, he's a very smart guy. There's a reason why Run DMC is who they are. You know, that's not an accident. You know, that doesn't happen. You don't become, you don't go to certain heights by accident. B. You may get a hit by accident, but you're not going to have a career unless inside of you is as big as the career that you're building. You know what I'm saying? So D is very smart dude. So yeah, yeah, that's my man. So funny, man. The funniest thing I can think about with MCA is him kicking me. We was at, <laughs> we was at his backstage and I think, I don't know if he was drunk or he was twisted or something, but I just remember us talking and him just like, he was like laying on some some speaker equipment or something and he kicked me. But, and you would think, the first thing in your mind, you would think, oh, L and M started fighting. But the shit was so funny to me that I couldn't stop laughing. Like, you know what I mean? Like I could have easily jumped on him and went crazy, but it was just so funny to me that this guy had the audacity to fucking kick me. It tickled the shit out of me. And we got along forever after that. And the thing about also is that you got to remember Ad Rock from the Beastie Boys is the guy who heard my demo tape and gave my demo to Rick Rubin. And him giving that tape to Rick Rubin is how ultimately Def Jam, the label was started. There was a, there was a, uh, Def Jam Productions had a song out called The Chores and it was on a label called Streetwise and Party Time. By t the song's by Tila Rock. It was the first time you saw the Def Jam logo. I bought that record and I sent the demo in, you know what I'm saying, to Rick Rubin and Rick and Russell Simmons ended up starting Def Jam, and I was the first artist on Def Jam. So that's kind of like one of the things that, you know, so when you see Def Jam and you hear about Def Jam and all the various artists that came later, it was me, Rick, and Russell that kind of, you know, started that and got that rolling, you know what I'm saying? So that was a vibe. But if you look at the original I Need a Beat, I actually went to the test pressing and wrote on it. You know what I'm saying? You can look at the vinyl and it's um it says Def Jam 001. You know what I'm saying? And like like I wrote, we wrote in the margins of the on the because at that time you would get like a when the test pressing was still a little warm, you could write on it before it hardened. You know what I'm saying? So it was like 
I forget exactly what I wrote, but I signed them joints too. It was crazy, you know what I'm saying? And Def Jam just exploded and turned into a whole nother thing. And we, in a, a little tidbit, like the first songs we did was independent. So the first couple of songs we did on Def Jam was independent. Then we went and got a deal with CBS. You know what I'm saying? It got distribution. So Def Jam was an independent label. Then it became this major thing that people know about today. You know, Rihanna, all these different artists and all that. What up? Shaman LL Cool J. You're checking out 24-7 HH, baby. You know what I mean? Peace.